Amen. So we're in week two of a series about remembrance, the power of remembrance. We started our journey last week by exploring how Jesus drank wine with his disciples, which represented his blood that would be spilt, washing away their sins. And then he instructed them while drinking this wine um, to also take bread and consume the bread representing his broken body and to do this continually in remembrance of him and what he would do on the cross to bring us salvation. He said, do this in remembrance of me. You see, Jesus wants us to remember what God has done so we never define ourselves by what we do, but accept who we are through Christ and what he did for us. And so God wants us to remember what he has done, but God also wants us to remember what he has spoken. Because we see Jesus later in the New Testament book of John chapter 14 verse 26 saying, The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. God doesn't only want you to live a life constantly remembering what he's done for you. He wants you to live a life in remembrance of what he has spoken. And often we need to be reminded of God's word that has been spoken in the past as part of our continual spiritual growth. And so we are in a season of remembering and reinforcing some of the most important spiritual truths that we've preached on over the past four years so that we don't forget in moments where we need the Holy Spirit to remind us what God has spoken so that we're empowered to navigate our lives into the future. And today I want us to look at a sermon that we preached in the second week of a series called Embracing What God Blesses. And in this specific week, I focused on identity for the Christian. We don't just have to know how to navigate our marriages, remembering certain things as spoken about last week. We need to continually remember and never forget where our identity is birthed from. And so we began this message as I begin this morning by asking the question, do you want to live a blessed life? Do you want to live a blessed life? And the answer would, of course, be yes. Many of us would have prayed in the past and asked God to bless us in certain areas of our lives. Lord, please bless me with this part of what I do. Lord, bless me when I start this business because we want to live a blessed life. But experiencing a blessed life doesn't necessarily mean God must bless what we embrace, but that we must embrace what God has already blessed. This principle is found in the historical documents of the Bible when Jesus was teaching on what is known as the Beatitudes. It's Christianese, but I'll explain it now. Oh, have you not learned about the Beatitudes? <laughs> Well, the word beatitude comes from the Latin meaning a conditional statement of blessedness. It's like the beatitude I would speak over our young drummer, Israel. You are such a gifted, amazing young drummer and a beatitude. And, and these statements of blessing in this portion of scripture we're going to look at were declared by Jesus during one of his sermons that is found in Matthew's gospel. Now, these beatitudes Jesus proclaimed were describing the blessedness of those who embrace the ways of living as one belonging to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven here not being a castle with a king, but referring to the reign and the rule of Jesus under which we, as children of his kingdom, choose to position ourselves in submission. So he's speaking about his kingdom and, and reign and those that live under submission to his lordship. And he's declaring blessings over them because Jesus calls us citizens of heaven. We are citizens of the kingdom of God, not of this world. 
And if we are positioned under the rule of God's kingdom as citizens of heaven, then it's not God who must bless what we embrace, but we who must embrace what he has already blessed. You're living within my kingdom. I've shown you where my blessing lies. Embrace it. Embrace what God blesses. And so Jesus declares the blessedness of those who embrace the ways of living as one belonging to the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of this world in, in what we call the Beatitudes. And Jesus starts teaching on these Beatitudes with the first Beatitude from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, where it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Jesus taught on a mountain, so consequently, this portion of Scripture and this teaching from Jesus has been famously known as the Sermon on the Mount. So when someone tries to be all clever with you with their theology and say, well, explain the theological background to the Sermon on the Mount. Ach, it's just because Jesus was sitting on a mountain and teaching. I don't even know where I was now. Uh, here I am. So it says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. And then it says, his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, here's the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We don't usually embrace poverty, do we? And now we're talking about the fact that we must embrace what he blesses. We don't pray, Lord, make me poor. Bless me with poverty. Sounds a little like a contradiction. Poor in spirit really actually means in this context an emptying of oneself and a consciousness that we are nothing in the presence of God by what we do, but his beloved only by what he has done. The, the number of riches, strength, and wealth I have to save myself leave me poor in comparison to being in the presence of Jesus who saved me and replaced me on the cross. In other words, Jesus starts teaching on these beatitudes with this concept. We enter the kingdom of God by surrendering the kingdom of self. But he's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. In other words, my children, you will enter the kingdom of God by surrendering the kingdom of self. And when we are emptied of self, there's nothing the enemy can take from us while there's room for everything God wants to give us. Yet, the challenge with embracing a poor spirit or emptying ourselves is that so often we want God to fill what we aren't willing to first empty. Oh God, I want to be poor in spirit. I want the blessings of the kingdom. But I'm not willing to let go. Empty myself. So we're led to ask ourselves the question based on this first beatitude. Where in my life at present do I need to be emptied of self-reliance and surrender to Jesus? So that's the first thing we learn. Okay. So, so where do I need to empty myself? Where have I become self-reliant? Where do I need to surrender to Jesus? Now, actually doing this is really hard. So please don't feel any pressure and walk away saying, geez, that's a bit heavy. This is really hard. The reason why it is so difficult is because it requires defining our worth outside of our own successful achievements. When I empty myself, it's suddenly not what I can make. It's suddenly, whoa, whoa, but, but by holding on to this, I feel better about myself. I look like a better person. I know that others think that I'm worthy of something. It's difficult because emptying ourselves, surrendering to Jesus outside of self-reliance actually means that we no longer define our worth outside of our own successful achievements. We like making something of ourselves through achievements, but it's not nice to look at the sinner buried under the busyness of that behavior that gives us a sense of being something. See, and now suddenly you stop burying yourself with your busyness 
defining yourself by what you do. And if you're truly emptying yourself, all you're left with is who you really are. Think about standing in front of the mirror naked. Think about yourself and no one else. Think about standing in front of the mirror naked. Have you ever seen those weight loss programs on TV? Where the contestants start by having to face themselves in a mirror. Stripped down of the clothes that hid their unhealthy bodies. You will often see as they confront themselves, they cover their eyes with their hands. Some of them start weeping. Because they're having to face the ugly reality of who they have become and what they have done to themselves. You see... As the deepest poverty lies in the sphere of the spirit, so the deepest mourning also lies there. Because as soon as you empty yourself, you begin to see who you are as the imperfect sinner that can't define themselves through striving in their own strength for success. I don't like this person. That's why the second beatitude of Jesus after poverty of spirit, is this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The mourning described here is a response to becoming poor in spirit. When we have the revelation of the imperfection, brokenness, and sin of self, When all the defining achievements of success are empty. And we go, oh my word. Look at me. God, I don't have it all together. I'm not as successful as I thought I was. I'm guilty. I have a dark side that I despise. And we begin to mourn. Paul the Apostle expresses this morning when he writes in Romans 7 verse 24 about his own revelation looking in the mirror as he's emptied himself. And he says, what a terrible failure I am. Who will save me from the sin that brings death to my body? What a terrible failure I am. Very often when we empty ourselves and we take a hard look at who we are, we mourn and we almost echo the words of Paul the Apostle. How terrible I am. How messed up I am. How bad I look. How badly I failed. How screwed up that mistake and that decision was. How I failed in my marriage. How I've failed to follow Jesus without the doubt that I've denied has been a truth in my life. How many of us today are saying this when we look at ourselves? You really think God loves you? You really think you're worthy of being used by Him? Do you really think anything you've ever done has made you worthy enough of God's reward? What, do you think you're really a Christian? Look at the way you think. You're crazy. Do you really think God loves you as much as he loves Grant? He preaches on the stage. He's such a good boy. I don't know what you say. But like Paul, many of us, when we see who we are emptied of creating and defining our worth through deeds, we'll begin mourning with shame and guilt. The danger is that sometimes, although we can acknowledge our imperfection by emptying ourselves and becoming poor of spirit, we make the mistake of then defining our worth by it. We make the mistake of not mourning because we simply acknowledge our imperfection in the presence of our Savior, but we sometimes mourn as we see ourselves for who we truly are and make the mistake of defining our worth by it. And Proverbs 23 verse 7 tells us that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
You become what you believe. I am imperfect, so I am unworthy. I fail to get it right, so I am a failure. And we begin to live out of this belief as victims of our own imperfection, unintentionally rejecting the blessing of the kingdom of God that we are invited into. God speaks to us in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, saying, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul the Apostle continues. He says, Therefore, because of this, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Boasting about weakness in the Scripture refers to living with God-given confidence. That's what it means. God-given confidence. But we reject God's power made perfect in our weakness when we feel unworthy of His blessing because we've seen ourselves for who we really are and allowed what we see to define our worth. Like Paul, we should be boasting about our weakness, but instead we define our worth by what we see. So we become our weakness. We should be boasting about our weakness in the goodness of God instead of becoming our weakness. When we see our imperfection after emptying ourselves and defining our worth by what we see, we reject the blessing of the kingdom of God that we're invited into. And it's interesting because Jesus actually paints a picture of this principle in Luke's gospel when he's telling a story to express what the kingdom of God is like to a group of people. And in Luke chapter 15 verse 11, it says that Jesus told them a story. He said, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. He left the reign and the rule of his father's house to go and do his own thing. And he took his inheritance and he left and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, sitting in the mud, he screwed up so bad. The guy's made bad decisions. He's sitting in the mud of his mistakes. And he says, he comes to his senses. He then said to himself, the young man became so hungry um, that he, he took from the pods he was feeding the pigs. They looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. Bing, something went off and he realized something. You know what? Even though I've left the reign and the rule of my father's house, rejected my father, and now find myself in a muddy mess of my own mistakes, the servants at my dad's house would get fed better than me. Hmm. You see, this young man had come to his senses. He reflected on who he was and what he had done. He saw the stains reminding him of the shame of his working in the pigsty as a direct result of his bad decisions. He was looking at his imperfection the stains of his mistakes, the same way we do when we empty ourselves. He had no performance to brag about anymore. He had no possessions to protect and no popularity to maintain, which could have defined his worth. He had been emptied of any identity he could have made for himself and now was looking in the mirror with shame at his imperfection. And as he came to his senses, he began mourning. Look where I am in this flippin' muddy pigsty because of my stupidity and my mistakes. The stains, not worthy of being a son, but even the servants in my dad's house are fed better than me now. And then he continues, I will go home then to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. This is what he thought to himself when he came to his senses. Now, 
Believing you're unworthy because of your imperfection means that you will settle for a position as a hired servant in the kingdom when God invites you to be a son. Don't settle for less than God's best because you don't believe you deserve it because of what you see when you empty yourself and begin to mourn. Then it continues. So the son returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring on his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Woo! Dum, dum, um, 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 oh, oh. They would have maybe sung, yeah. It's your birthday. Eh, eh, because, you know, it was like he was coming home. It was like, you're born again to me. You're home again. It's like, you've come home. You were lost, but you were found. So this imperfect son returns home to a father who celebrated who he was, even with the stench and the stains of a pigsty, starting when the son came to his senses at the messiest moment in his life. All of this started when the son sat in the messiest moment of his life. When that son felt the most shame and the obvious guilt for the stench and the the stain of a pigsty on him physically, when he realized how much he had messed up and he was at the bottom of the barrel, somehow that was not the point of final defeat, defining him as a failure in the sight of God. It didn't move him to run further from his father's house. The morning actually moved him closer. You see, your morning moves you towards discovering your worth instead of you assuming that you created your worth with your bad decisions and imperfections. Blessed are those who mourn. Why would someone mourning be blessed? Why would someone looking in the mirror and feeling so guilty and shameful about who they are and how imperfect they are and how much they've screwed up, why would they be blessed? Because in the kingdom of God, when we mourn in our weakness and imperfection, it doesn't move us away from God. It moves us closer to Him. And then suddenly, while we are still a long way off, he begins running. And we're still defining ourselves as slaves while the father's running toward a son. And then when he takes us with a a dipped head in shame, we begin to recognize that we could never create our worth, but only discover it in whose we are. So don't get stuck in the mud of mourning. Let your mourning move you toward your maker. Don't get stuck in the mud of mourning. Grant, you don't know how screwed up I am though, Grant. You don't know how I failed in my marriage and I don't have it anymore and I can't go and tell people I'm a Christian. Look what happened. I I never thought it happened. Don't get stuck in the mud of your morning. Let your morning move you towards your maker. I want you to look at this picture of a pair of socks. They're the most boring socks I've ever seen. Gray. Now, when we look at these, we may estimate their value to maybe be around 200, 300 bucks if you bought them from Woolworths. They're socks. That's what we see. The only way we would really discover their value is not by estimating based on what we see there, but by taking them back to their manufacturer, to their maker. Like the son who had to go back to his father's house. You see, 
Contrary to the value that we may place on these socks, like the son placed on himself because of his sin, these are manufactured by Harry's of London and made from 100% servelt taken from the New Zealand red deer. If you took them back to their maker, you would thank your aunt for that pair of socks at Christmas. If you took them back to their maker, you would discover that these socks required the most intensive and delicate handwork due to the weaving and the dyeing process required when dealing with servile fibers. And you would also discover, not create, but discover that their retail value is 300,000 rand. Making them the most expensive socks in the entire world. The prodigal son had to be moved by the morning of his muddy mess closer toward his father. As he got closer, he didn't create his worth, but he discovered a value he could not see. Because while his father saw a masterpiece, all he could see was a mess. Just like the value of those socks is based on the intricate weaving. I'm reminded of the fact that you and I too were delicately woven together by our maker. I'm reminded of the words of Psalm 139 verse 13 that describes that you were created in the inmost being that God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And therefore, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't get stuck in the mud of mourning. Let your mourning move you towards your maker. And as you do, you will discover that your sense of low self-worth and your mourning Turn into discovering your value in God's eyes and joyful dancing. The psalmist describes this in his celebration song from Psalm 30 verse 11 when he says, You have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. Blessed are those who mourn. Why? Because if we mourn as followers of Jesus, it doesn't lead us away from God, but moves us closer. And in that we discover the fullness of our belovedness, regardless of what we've done, because it's defined by what Christ did. And we find joy and our mourning turns into dancing. Imagine how the lost son would have danced in celebration on discovering his worth in the sight of his father, regardless of his sin, which he thought defined him as a hired servant. Your mourning moves you towards discovering your worth instead of assuming you created it with your bad decisions and imperfections. It's discovered, not created. But it requires moving through your mourning. You see, when Paul the Apostle wrote what we read earlier about describing himself when he looked in the mirror, when he said, who will save me from the sin? Who will save me from the sin? He said, I, I, I'm filthy. Who will save me from the sin? He then goes on to explain who it is in verse 25. And he says, I thank God who saves me. He saves me through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, he goes, I'm so filthy and so messed up. Who can save me? I'm mourning. Look at me in the mirror. I've emptied myself of, of defining myself by what I've done. And look at me. I, I, I don't stand a chance. But thank God that it is Jesus that saves me. That he saves me through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is because your identity is not defined by what you have done. But what Christ has or but what Christ did. That is why blessed are those who mourn. For they will be comforted. They will be comforted in the knowledge that I am loved so much by God that he was willing to pay for me with Jesus. I'm comforted 
in the knowledge that I'm not defined by what I have done, but what Jesus already did. I'm comforted in knowing I am beloved by God and His mercies are new every morning, that I don't have to perform well or possess much or become popular with others in order to please my heavenly Father who places a robe on my shoulders, a ring on my finger, and sandals on my feet, even when I carry the stains and the smell of sin and imperfection. And so I pray that through your life, the Holy Spirit would bring to remembrance this truth. I may mourn as I acknowledge my weakness, but it moves me toward God's power made perfect. I mourn in my weakness, but it moves me toward God's power made perfect.